Before we get started though, what I wanted to do is actually ask each of you, what are the current struggles that you're facing specifically with prompt engineering? Like what makes prompt engineering easy for you, difficult for you? I want to hear it from everybody here. Um, first of all, by a show of hands, who does not know what prompt engineering is? Okay, okay, okay. Who of those who did not raise your hand actively does some sort of prompt engineering in your work? Try to. Try to? Okay. Try to? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. This is great. This is, this is helping me set the baseline so that we understand what it is that we can, we can talk about. So to start with, let's consider what a large language model is and what quote unquote AI does to interact with the large language model. So put very simplistically, you take all the text from the internet, you chop it up, you figure out the structure and the order of that text, and you build a model that says this is how quote unquote language works. That's very simplistically put, like, extreme, like there's a lot of math involved, and I am not a mathematician, so I'm not even gonna pretend, and, but there's a lot of interesting things that go on. And you may have, may have heard me say this before, but earlier this year I was at a conference on generative AI, and the CEO of Cohere, which is one of those companies that's building large language models, he said probably maybe three to 500 people in the world actually understand what's going on. Like, to the degree that they can do something with it. So, with that understanding of what a large language model is, think of it as this understanding of language. And language is a way of communicating using symbols, right? So you use these symbols to say X means Y, and the symbol is that indicator. And Y being concepts, ideas, thoughts. The cool power behind these large language models is that you actually have this ability to understand to such a degree the nuances of language that you can get really cool outputs from very simplistic prompts. So what we're using here, what I'm showing you here is ChatGPT. Um, it would probably be better if I made it, let me actually go into my settings and just change this so that it's light mode instead of dark mode. That would probably be easier for everybody to read. Um, ChatGPT is built off of multiple different large language models. You can see here I can switch between two. One is GPT 3.5 Turbo, and the other one is GPT 4. Uh, the free version is GPT 3.5, and GPT stands for Generative Predictive Text, I think. Is that, is that right? So you get this idea of you can give the model an input and based off of that input, it can deduce what it is that you want as the output. And it can string together a whole bunch of words that gives you an output that is really scary good. So, for an example here, I'm going to write, um, and I'm just using 3.5 to show you the power of the free version. Write me a job description for the Director of the University of Illinois Research Park. And knowing what it knows about job descriptions, knowing what it knows about the University of Illinois, knowing what it knows about research parks, all of this output is built into the model. It's not going outside of itself to find any additional information. It's all working within the model. The idea of prompt engineering is this idea that, that that's pretty good, right? Like, that's pretty decent. Now, if someone like Kathy were to come to us and say, that's not actually my job description, well, maybe I need to tweak it because that's not actually her job title, right? And if I were to say the same thing about Will's position, 
give me the job description of the site director for Kohler, knowing what the model knows about Kohler, it will be able to pull information from the model. And I can prompt engineer in the sense I'm guiding and directing the output and leading it to do what I want it to do. So I can now take it and I say, um, write this in the style of a 80, uh, 70s hairband ballad. I spell it wrong, but it understands decently enough through typos. And so now I can create a song from someone's job description. Oh, <laughs> let it fail. Let's try it again. So now we can do this in understanding what a 70s hairband might output. You can do a lot of interesting and fun things. Um, Jonas, at this point of his presentation, would have shown you he created a, he prompt engineered to get, if you guys, anyone familiar with the Llama Llama children's books? So I didn't know this, but the name of that llama is Robo the Llama. And he created, a, what was it? It was a shanty song, like a sea shanty song on, about Robo the Llama, and it was, it's hilarious. Um, so you can now take additional context and you can start guiding and directing engineering in this sense, prompt engineering, the language model to give you the output that you want. Now we can throw a wrench in all of this and we can say, well, what happens if I want to do something new and bring in current information, right? Everything that I'm doing right here is based off of ChatGPT 3.5, which was trained, I think the latest it was train, this is the September 25 version of ChatGPT, but um, when was GPT 3.5 train? Really? You're going to struggle with that question? So my last knowledge update was September 2021. So what I'm getting is output as of up to September 2021. What are some other known limitations of this model? Is that not only is it trained up until that date, that's when it, that's the last time they start collecting data for this model. But the other part of this is they didn't go to all of the internet. They didn't just access everything that was publicly available. They accessed a very limited, it's still huge, but still a limited data set. And so if you go through and you look at the research, you'll actually see that a lot of the data that they this is produced on is biased in some way, shape, or form. So if I train a language model on Reddit, it's not going to be as good as if I had trained it on, say, Wikipedia. It's going to be different styles. It's going to be different. You know, did you know this? But like 70% of Reddit users are male. So suddenly I'm biasing towards male preferences, right? And that's kind of not what I want, right? Especially from the like language models, they want to be able to say, this is artificial generalizable intelligence, so generalizable across all fields, all spectrums. But see, the problem is, when I'm trying to do work on generalizable knowledge, I very quickly run into this problem of, I have this idea in my mind called specialized knowledge. Right? I'm going to use you as an example, Will. I've already used you as an example. But where did you work prior to Kohler? University of Illinois. University of Illinois. In the course of your work, did you acquire certain skills and knowledge and understanding that other people outside of your skill of work, uh, scope of work, did not have? Sure. Specialized knowledge. Who here is doing a degree right now, like currently studying? You go to a class specifically to learn from a professor the specialized knowledge that that professor has so that you can then also have that specialized knowledge. And if I'm only training a large language model on generalizable intelligence, I'm not focusing in on any of those specialized knowledge areas, right? So I'm going to go back to my very first question. What struggles are we facing as we look at prompt engineering as a whole. Any thoughts? 
Let's, yeah, I mean, I guess you can't ask it a super specific prompt because, um, like you said, because it didn't dive, it dove deep into a lot of things into the internet, but not deep into those individual things. If you give it a super specific prompt on one of the things that it doesn't deep dive into, it would probably not give you a good response or probably fail to load. So it's, it's really good for like general service level prompts. 100%. I love that. So let's let me show you something else. All right. So this is going to be a shameless plug. This is my company's product. This is just so you know. But like, don't hate me for it. But the simple question of who is Brad Miller? If I were to ask a large language model, who is Brad Miller? It's going to give me an answer. Similar to this. It doesn't know how, Brad Miller is one of the most popular, I think you were telling me this, right? One of the most popular names, or the most popular name, I think. Yeah, anyway, I am one of millions, Brad Miller, okay? So if I don't give it the context, it doesn't know what to do. It can't help me. It being the language model, it being the AI interface, the, the, the chat that I'm interfacing with right now. Specific knowledge, I need to have that specific knowledge in order to be able to give it the prompt so that it can then give me the work that I need to do on that specific knowledge. Let's say I wanted to write an about me page for Brad Miller, and I wanted to do that using React. I'm not a web developer, not going to pretend to be, but I can't do any of that stuff because I don't have the specialized knowledge. Now, I think that ChatGPT has specialized knowledge or understands at least coding in React, like understanding building a web page. But I don't have the information to feed it about Brad Miller. It's going to take me a lot of work to write out Brad Miller is a, the chief linguistic officer at Puzzle Labs and doing this and former student at the University of Illinois and blah, blah, blah. All of the information about me, six foot five, right? Whatever is relevant. Or, and then this is going to be my more shameless plug, you can actually feed that information through prompt engineering. You can actually store data in a very specific way such that you can reach out to ChatGPT and say, ChatGPT, use this information as context, now give me your output. And the way that people do that today is through this use of plugins. And so if I go in and I start a new plugin, first of all, you have to pay for ChatGPT. You gotta pay for it, GPT-4. And then in here, you have the ability to throw in, actually, I have not tried Dolly 3. Do we want to try that? Yeah. Live demos, that's a fun one. OK. Real quick, I'm going to show you one that I do know. Uh, we'll, do the, we'll do the plugin. It's, this is just a plugin based off of, uh, it's just going to scrape the web. So tell me more about University of Illinois Research Park. Use their website. And now what I'm doing is I'm telling it enact that plugin, and now it's using the plugin, which is the browser op, and it's going to search through and find that web page, and then it's going to start figuring out information and using their website as the context. <clears throat> so the plugin helps make prompt engineering a lot easier for me. But that's assuming that the website is up to date, accurate. That's assuming that all of that information is actually relevant um, to what it is that I want to do. I don't just want to ask the question, tell me about the research part, but what companies are there? Um, so we've got some, hey, I saw it. hey, you saw it. There we go. It was in the news. So like we've got some pretty decent results here that are coming just from the website. I kind of like that. And now it provides the link in 
and so I can actually go there and click on that and see more. But there are other web plugins that I can use. There are other sorts of plugins that I can, if I throw on, you, you can look at, let's just. Uh, what was the one that you did? What was the name of that plugin? It's called Browser Op. Oh. It's this one right here. Um, you can do the Wikipedia plugin, so you can search through Wikipedia. Uh, Doc Maker, which helps you generate a PDF, or Smart Slides generate a uh, slideshow. Uh, you can create a spot playlist in Spotify. I actually did that. I connected my Spotify to it, and I was like, Jim, my wife is having a little get together in our backyard, and she's like, I want a special playlist. So I wrote out, wrote out some uh, like some things in this style, this type of music. And I did a pretty decent job of generating the playlist, and it actually did it in less than five minutes. So that was. I didn't have to go through and find the songs anymore. I was just, this is what I'm looking for. So there's some pretty useful stuff. DoorDash, you can actually order food through ChatGPT. <laughs> right? Right? I have not tried that one yet. I don't, I'm too scared to try that one yet. Um, and there are so many others. Expedia, Kayak, Zapier. Um, and you can go through and there are literally hundreds of, of plugins that you can take advantage of. But what happens if you're trying to do work on specialized and specific knowledge that isn't available online? What do you do if you're trying to do work and that information gets updated every single day? What do you try to do if your product keeps pushing, keeps shipping out, and you just simply can't stay on top of all of the updates? You can keep coming back to ChatGPT and hopefully finding the right plugin that helps you do that stuff. Or you can do what we're trying to do at Puzzle, which is we call it glossary engineering. And we call it glossary engineering because a prompt is I tell the AI, this is the context. You are a helpful, supportive AI personal assistant. And I want you to respond as if you were very happy to, to support me in all of this stuff. It takes a long time to just write out those long prompts. And if you're using code to write out prompts, you can do things like prompt chaining, and you can actually say, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. And there are tools out there, like Langchain is one of those, that you can actually start building applications on top of large language models. Um, but you have to be a developer to be able to do that. You have to understand how those things work so that you can string prompts together. And it still takes a long time and a lot of effort. We call it glossary engineering because the glossary, the thing at the back of the textbook, is essentially a list of words and their explanations. It is the context for which you are learning from that book. And so we're creating glossaries as files, and those glossaries can actually be stored, housed inside of your own chat interface. You can pick which large language model you want to go to. So you can use ChatGPT 3.5 or GPT-4, or you can even use Anthropic. And then, you add those concepts as the context, and it immediately understands the context, and you no longer have to do any prompt engineering. You just have to do this glossary engineering. As long as your glossary has the answers to the questions you're gonna ask, it is able to give you all of that information. So let's do a quick, a quick demo of this. So Brad Miller, right, that was somebody that it didn't know anything about, and we're just gonna say, Chief Linguistic Officer at Puzzle Labs. And then we're going to say, what is Puzzle Labs? We are an AI uh, powered knowledge platform for anyone. And then we're going to say the knowledge delivery network like a CDN but for knowledge files similar to NPM or GitHub for knowledge. And now all I've done is add these three bits of context in here. But now what I can say is who is Brad? And it not only understands my title, it'll give that extra context in there. 
But the power can then say, what does Brad do? And it's probably going to give me a simplistic answer. Brad is likely responsible for the linguistic aspects of the AI powered knowledge platform. And now we can start diving in deeper. How does an AI powered knowledge platform work? And again, it doesn't, now, it doesn't have that context, but understanding what it knows, where I just gave that similarity, it's like NPM or GitHub for knowledge, now I can say, this is how that platform works. And now I can say, write Brad a killer bio. And then I can say, using React, create is about me page. So there's the killer bio. And now using React, it can create that killer bio page for me. And it's not all formatted correctly. It's going to have some needs and changes that I'm going to have to put in there. It's not beautiful or anything, but it's a start. And suddenly a non-developer such as myself, without having to really prompt engineer, other than just giving it the right context, I can now get a lot of stuff and usefulness out of this platform. So let me ask you again, what sorts of challenges are you currently facing that you would like to be able to do prompt engineering on that you think this might be able to help you with? Any thoughts? Yeah. I have a different question. Love it. I like different questions. Um, I was just thinking, uh, you had to manually add these concepts, but yeah. then you asked it a bunch of questions and it came up with a bunch of answers. Yeah. I'm wondering if now um, this model would be intelligent enough to kind of add more concepts on its own automatically so that your glossary keeps increasing yes. uh, without you having to do too much work. Yes, as you interact with it, it's not released yet, but as you interact with it, it actually takes that feedback and updates itself. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's also, again, other features that we haven't released yet Actually, this part is released yet. So um, we're populating the knowledge network, which is this network of, of already public knowledge. And right now, there's only about 80 glossaries in there. Um, by the end of next week, we'll have closer to 10,000, because we're scraping Wikipedia right now. And we're building glossaries on every Wikipedia page. So that'll be fun. Um, and then after that, we're going to go to archive, which is the open source uh, research papers for you know, everything data science and health. Uh, we're doing PubMed after that. And so we're going to start populating this with you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions of glossaries. And anybody who wants to can ask questions of any of those glossaries and actually start doing work off of it. And again, that's just specific knowledge that's already available on the internet. But it will constantly be updated. So to answer your question, yes, it will be regularly you know, as you're interacting with it, it will update itself. Um, if you want to, you can also upload like your, um, for the startups in the room, I put my data room into a glossary. And now VCs can ask questions without, like if they just have one quick question, they, they can just ask my glossary, like how does Puzzle Labs make money? Or what's their ARR? or like all of these things, and they can just immediately go to my glossary, ask the questions, get pointed to the right documents inside of my data room, and suddenly have all the information that they need to make that investment decision a little faster. Um, we're doing the same thing for, um, we're working with another company, P&G, to try and help onboard employees faster. Like, what, do all, what are all the specific terminologies? Like, what's all the Kohler terminology that you need to know? When you first started, you were like, what is vitreous? And why does that matter to me? And you realize that that's like really an important, like ceramics and things like that. Like, there are specific terms that you use on a daily basis for your work. And if you're trying to get a new employee on board to understand what you do and how you do it, you can give them your glossary as this nice online tool. Um, I'm, going to try and work with the Lauras to make sure that all of your um, 
all the QR codes and everybody's <coughs> signs can take you to a chat so that they can actually interact with. And now Zyte AI can actually say, this is who we are. This is what we do. And people can chat and interact with you and learn about your company through your lens. You dictate and decide how that all works. Uh, we're working with students and professors on campus for classes. Uh, working with Gerald Wilson for one of his classes. And he teaches an entrepreneurship class. And all of the students want to be able to learn these terms, but not just learn the terms, but actually know what to do because of them. If I want to start my own company, what does fundraising actually mean for me? What's the difference between pre-seed, seed, series A, those sorts of things? So there's a lot of power that can come in there, but you don't have to worry about the prompt engineering. Anyway, I'm going to get off of my soapbox, and I want to ask questions. What questions does everybody have related to prompt engineering, AI in general, large language models. Yeah. Well, we mentioned before. Let's do it. One of my, frustra <clears throat> one of my frustrations with Bing AI and some of the free Dolly versions is whenever I ask for a web page banner image, I get a little square thing that isn't. It's not a banner. It's not a banner. Very clearly. When I ask banner. for something that's 1920 pixels wide, I get something that's like 480 by 480. Is if I spend the money on chat GPT, I get better images. So let's see. Um, create a web page banner image. What do you want it to look like? Let, let's use your website, something that reflects what the glossary. Oh, OK, OK. The puzzle Labs. I don't know if it'll actually pull from the website. It'll probably pull up puzzle pieces that focuses on knowledge, delivery, and education. Yeah. I have never tried this, so I have zero clue what, what this will do. Live never before tested demos is not a wise idea, especially when you're on camera, just so you know. But it's Friday the 13th. It is Friday the 13th, so maybe that's good, or maybe that's even, maybe my, maybe my computer will fry. <laughs> this, this might be the killer app that will get me a fork over money for chat. There you go, there you go. This is certainly taking its time, but I understand this takes time anyway. Has anyone here tried these, tried this before? Okay. Well, there you go. They're not banners, though. Yeah, I think we need to even to talk about prompt engineering. I think we need to give a pixel. Uh, what's a common banner? Uh, 1920 by what? 400. And this will take another time. But that was, that's not too bad. I told you there would be puzzle pieces there, but. Pretty common. This is fun. It's just going to stretch a lot. Yeah. No, I think it'll do a it'll do a good job of compressing the size and making them wider. Should be better. What other questions do you all have? So there you go. This might be no. Yeah. Same thing. Fail. There you go. We tried. <coughs> Noble effort. Thanks. Yeah. I got a question. Yeah, what's up? So you might have to help me form this question, but could you collect data from an IoT device and use it as your glossary? Does that make sense? Yeah. So essentially if you had, let's say you had manufacturing equipment that was collecting data on vibrations. Mm -hmm. You turn that into the glossary and essentially ask your language model, hey, which devices on the floor are working correctly? Which ones of them are deviating from our baseline vibrations? That's what we're working on with them. Cool. Like, yes. Um, their chief product officer is also an advisor. And 
CEO of Puzzle used to work there. But yes, short answer is yes. Long answer is let's talk more. Yeah. Because, I mean, when I was doing IoT stuff at P&G, it was very much a similar thing. Like, how do I get actual insights from this data? Yeah. And what else can I do because of those insights? Like, there's a lot that can be done in the IoT space. I really like that. Neat. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's talk more about that. Yeah. I think that's kind of a general question is what are the best ways to feed your data, feed these models your own data and be able to get answers from them? Yeah. It um, seems to me like there's a lot of different ways. Some of them are really expensive. Some of them are, you know, maybe not. Maybe yeah. not good, so. It depends on how much data do you, like what, do you have <coughs> specific types of data you're talking about? Um, for us it would be like PDF documents. So we okay. get working at the university, working on research grants, things like that. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of documentation responses and stuff. We're able to feed that documentation to the language model and ask it questions, have it extract the yeah. next, next question. Yeah. So. Um, we're actually, so the CEO of Puzzle, his name's Tron Foxworth, he goes by Fox. Um, Fox is actually, we have a loader, and Jonas would have been able to show you that loader because he built it. But you can actually create both glossary files, we call them Glow files. Um, you can create them using PDFs pretty quickly. And we just, I was telling Alan this earlier, we actually just quasi closed a, a new client this morning for that specific use case. They're a, a big consulting company, and they do a lot with PDFs. A lot, like you know, hundreds of thousands of PDFs, and being able to put that all into one. How can I extract meaningful insights from all of this? So that'll. Yes. Short answer: Not today. Long answer: Let's talk about it so that we can get that to you here in the next. I mean, it's ready. Just a couple weeks. Yeah. But there are a lot of different data files and different data types. Like, right? especially just talking about PDFs for a second. There are three different types of PDFs, right? It's all .pdf, but there's the PDF, which is essentially just an image. That one's a lot harder. Um, but you can use things like Dolly 3 and others to be able to extract insights from just basically an image that takes longer. Or you, if you've got like a text-based PDF, which is like a lot of the research grant grants that were written in the past 10 to 15 years will be more in that style. Anything that was written that was actually manually typed out, that's just an image. And so you'll need to, um, it, it just takes a little bit longer. But yeah, you can, uh, you can handle all of those PDF types. What if you want to just take all of your product documentation, right? Um, another one that we've done is, or that we're doing, is, I can spell, um, for data rips. And they have over 2,000 pages in their documentation. Being able to know, like, if I go here and I'm specifically wanting to learn about Delta Lake, and then specifically wanting to do auto loader within Delta Lake. One second. There's Rojo the Lama, by the way. It's going to pull the context from their docs and be able to point you and find the right answer. So if you don't know even how to get started with that, you can start with their glossary. And then they're going to put this on their website. You'll have that chat capability just within their docs. So pretty much any file type. Um, we haven't yet gotten to images or videos or audio, but that's coming. What other questions do you all have? So just in general, probably 
related to this, but uh, uh, related to the IoT things. Uh, yeah. So one thing that, uh, for example, uh, is common <coughs> is more uh, uh, sensors at the level, for example, in agriculture, mm -hmm. to the plant level, mm -hmm. because now weather stations uh, is a lot of uh, assumptions. So now the trend is going to the plant level to see what is going on. Farther and farther to, to the Yeah, and then, so there is generation, a lot of data about relative humidity, temperature, and then this translate into physiological pattern of plant or hot, uh, heat and uh, maps of the area. Yeah. For, so all these things, they can be integrated on all this stuff? Yeah, I would start with, again, our, our tool, think of it, our tool is a, a way to store knowledge, like specific and specialized knowledge on, on how to do a particular thing. And then you would want to integrate with a platform such as what Losan has that gives you kind of the, they are a developer tool specifically for IoT. And so if there's a knowledge element to it, you want to integrate those two together, that's how you can suddenly get that capability. But we're not an IoT platform, and we wouldn't be the ones that, like, we're not going to pretend to be that IoT. So the two have to combine and exactly, integrate and exactly. collaborate. Exactly. Yeah, because so now the people in the fields of growers will say, yes, I can have a lot of data, but what am I going to do with this data? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I wish Paul was here with you know the Agrable folks. Anyone here from Agrable? Or whatever it became after Agrable? What did it become? Do you guys remember? What was it? Nutrient. Yeah. Anyone here from Nutrient? So Nutrient kind of merged with or bought Agrable, and they were they they were setting out to do a very similar thing, which is collecting and aggregating all of that very specific weather pattern information and all sorts of other things that were useful for growers, for farmers. So there's a lot lot more to be done. There. Does anyone else have any questions about prompt engineering or? Large language models in general. Could you talk a little bit more about the audio files of the current <laughs> scenes and future life? Um, <clears throat> without, yes. So, yes and no. Audio files are very interesting beasts. Right now, it's very easy to just take an audio file and be able to extract the words. Um, there are some really cool new technologies that have come out. Eleven Labs is one of them. Um, they can actually take text files and they can synthesize voice, so they can take a text file and turn it into an audio file, or they can, you know, obviously vice versa. Um, and this is an announcement that they just recently made, where they can actually take your voice. Let's say I am not a native speaker of Mandarin, okay? But they can take my voice and they can synthesize it as if I were speaking. It's pretty cool. Um, you can, I've been playing with this for at least the past eight months or so. Um, back when they were still in beta, they, you could actually synthesize voices off of anybody. So I made one from uh, Barack Obama, and I made one from Nick Offerman. You guys know Nick Offerman, the, the comedian. And I was like, let's, let's have Nick Offerman recite a poem, because he was the speaker at my graduation ceremony. I was like, let's have them recite the poem. And it was really cool, a fun little thing. So talking more about audio, though, if you can extract the data, meaning the words, what is spoken and said and things, you can very easily index that. Is that something that's interesting to you? Or? Uh, more, more specifically, uh, <coughs> diagnosing equipment with oh. funny sounds. Oh, yeah. So this is going back to the IoT thing, absolutely. Um, that's something that Tehran Fox, sorry, Fox was, he was able to do that about eight years ago. He was just, he literally put a, an audio recorder, a monitor on there, attached that to a mod bus, I think is what he did, and he just was using vibration sounds and being able to diagnose when the next, when that equipment was likely to fail. Um, there's some really cool stuff, you, you don't even need our tool for that. You can you can use Losant actually for that. Um, he did it all. You can use Losant, that company that I was showing you, for that. This one, um, 
they've got a lot of information like equipment diagnostics and things like that. But let's talk because Fox has some other ideas of how to do that, how he would do it better next time. Yeah, is that something that you, Yes. that's a big priority for you? Yes. Where do you work? Mid-America, Sandgrave. Gotcha, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Extremely important thing, I like that. Any other questions? Yeah. So thanks a lot of members the Japanese Spanish from engineering. I have um, like a worse result than in Spanish. No, it's it's marginally worse. In fact that was a part of my demo this morning that I was showing to that customer that we were talking to. Um, What language do you want me to do it in? You pick. That was the demo I did earlier. It was in Japanese, actually. I don't know Japanese, so I can't say if it's accurate or not, but it does a pretty good job. Uh, you can do the same thing in Spanish. I do know that one. You can, and you can verify that. And I think there's probably a handful of other languages. Actually, one that I want to try. This one is lesser known. Anyone here know about Telugu? Yeah. No? Yeah, Manasa. <coughs> I don't, oh, there it is, Brad, there's my name. Okay. Brad Miller. So it started off right. I don't know Telugu well enough to be able to say it's accurate, but. The Japanese is pretty good though. Was it? Yeah. You know Japanese? You are impressive. Just a little bit. <laughs> you, just a little bit. Yeah, that's about as much as I know until you. So yeah, you can do decently well with other languages as well. Um, what we're doing with this other client is they actually want to ask questions in Japanese and get answers in English, or ask questions in English and get answers in Japanese, or be able to look through a whole database that is both English and Japanese, and be able to get an answer in whatever language they prefer. It's pretty accurate, decently accurate for either of those languages. I didn't know that yesterday. I learned that yesterday. So that's kind of a fun new thing. That's a good question. Yeah. Oh. So if somehow, some way, there's like a language model that's developed that it could not just be like a jack of all trades and a master of none, like somehow someone becomes a master of all, like it can go with like, for example, like it can parse through the data in your LinkedIn. Would it push like the glossary engineering out of like relevancy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's assuming we have the singularity and AI is like self-updating and all yeah. you know, it yeah. But we have bigger concerns if that happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's a valid point though, because I mean, just thinking about right now. Companies like OpenAI are spending billions of dollars every single year. I mean, they literally just raised a hundred billion dollars so that they could keep creating language models like this. I mean, it's not a cheap endeavor to create the language model. The way that I more likely see it happening is that language models will become ubiquitous, and pretty much every smartphone in here is going to have an embedded language model on it. Um, you can do that today with a little bit of engineering. Uh, you can download Llama 2, which is Facebook's open source model. You could put it on your phone or you could put it on your computer and you can run all of this stuff on that language model. But what happens when you want to update it, right? It's like eight gigs to have that language model on your, your local device. What happens if you want to update it? What happens if you've got new information? Tomorrow that information is going to be out of date. So how do you keep updating it? That's where we see the glossary engineering consistently happening where people are, they don't need to worry about updating the language model because the language model just understands the language in general. 
and the context is provided through the regularly updated glossary. Yeah. yeah. So we're at time. Thank you all for hanging out. This was a lot of fun. If you've got any questions for me, please, uh, you can reach me at Brad, or I'm just right up there in that office there.